Hello Caroline, thank you so much for joining me today on A Bit Lit. Um, I already know you quite well because we went to university together and have known each other for a long time, but for people who are watching this who don't know you as well, could you start by telling me about yourself please? So I normally describe myself as a writer and a podcaster. Uh, I'm a writer of articles, I also wrote a book that came out last year and as a podcaster, I make a podcast about detective fiction and I also sometimes work on other people's podcasts, editing and helping them with them. Lovely, thank you. That's a really helpful summary of sort of the range <laughs> of different things you do. Did you, at what point did you become aware that podcasting, which was obviously a relatively new genre when you started working on it, was going to be part of your life? Were you sort of planning on being a writer and then podcasting popped up or did the two kind of coexist organically? You know, it was definitely the former. So um, out of university, I did a master's in newspaper journalism. And I definitely thought that that was what my career would be insofar as print publications continued to exist, I would work for them. And I think in the first couple of years of having a job, I quite quickly, like a lot of younger people, I think, realised that there was a lot of resistance to online journalism and working on the web amongst people more established in their careers so you could you could advance quite rapidly by being interested and showing yourself to be quite efficient at doing things online so i quickly got into that and one of the first sort of more responsible jobs i had was actually being the web editor for a publication and it was the first time they'd even had somebody in that role so that was you know one quite quick move i made i had no idea that audio would end up being significant though and it was actually the magazine I worked at, The New Statesman, it was the centenary in 2013. And I'd been listening to podcasts for three or four years. I think I listened to my first one around 2008, nine. We were still at university. And so I liked them just in my personal life. But then around the centenary of the magazine, there was a bit more sort of budget and scope for people wanting to do projects that you could say were mm. to celebrate the centenary. And so I said, well, what about a podcast? You know, what if we could, into, we did this massive centenary issue of the magazine. And we also, I was involved in publishing two anthologies of writing from the first hundred years of the magazine and that kind of thing. What That's about exciting. if we did a podcast that also showcased some of this? And there was a general <laughs> sort of sense of well if it doesn't interfere with the rest of your work and it doesn't cost any money <laughs> knock yourself out so i took that as a yes and created a podcast for the magazine which was incredibly lo-fi to start with i was very fortunate to have a colleague a sub-editor who was a basically professional musician in his spare time and so he knew all about microphones and recording equipment for music, but that translated fairly well. So he helped me set it up from a technical point of view. And I learned loads from him about that. And yeah, we just went for it. And Fantastic. I guess because it went surprisingly well, that's why it then became a bigger part of my job. You know, that first mm -hmm. podcast very quickly found quite a big audience. And as more technology and so on, to do with podcasts arrived in the UK. We, uh, that podcast was one of the first to be on Acast, which is a kind of podcast hosting and monetization platform. So we started making money from adverts for it and it all just kind of snowballed from there. So it wasn't anything that I planned, but once I was in it, I really liked it and I kind of kept going. Amazing. And so was that when you sort of found it snowballing, obviously it's it snowballed quite intensively because it's not just ended up being something that you do yourself personally for your own podcast, but that, as you said, you write about podcasts, you do podcasts for other people. What is it about the form that really kind of grabbed you and made it seem something worth investing all that time in and say spending all that time on it when it was not a official part of your job and actually advocating for it as a form? Is it, do you feel it has differences to radio that make it, are there things that are particularly attractive as a form of audio sort of presentation? I think there's two things. One is quite personal to me and to do with my personality, which is that I really liked how, and this is similar actually to online journalism, although not always, I really liked the immediacy of it. Like I could have an idea, we could make an episode about it. And then I was the one who clicked publish. There was no great layers of sort of 
uh, management or faff or anything involved. Not like making a, ma a magazine or designing a website or anything else that I did that took months and months and involved lots of meetings. Um, this was just something that I sort of had some autonomy over. So I really liked that as a kind of creative thing that you could just execute your idea and there it was and people could start listening to it immediately. And then from the other side, from the, lis the listener perspective, I kind of found out for myself by doing it, but there is quite a substantial body of research into this now about the intimacy that comes from listening to a podcast as opposed to radio. Mm -hmm. Radio is, although people do listen to the radio on their own, it's more generally a communal experience Like you listen to it in the car with someone else or it's on in the background in the kitchen whilst your whole family's there. Whereas you, you almost never put a podcast on and you all sit around and listen. It's just not how the form has grown up. So it's very much the, the norm that a podcast host is talking in your headphones and it feels like there's only the two of you there. And that incredibly intimate and close re relationship has sort of pays dividends in terms of listener engagement when you're thinking about a podcast as more of like a media company. Podcast listeners are incredibly engaged, you know, and that runs from if you say, hey, we, we the podcasters are doing an event next Wednesday, come along. You'll get way more people <laughs> proportionally turning up if you say that on a podcast than if you just put it at the bottom of an article on a website, say. Mm. Or, uh, and then that's also the effect that translates into why podcast advertising is very valuable, because, you know, I'm sure lots of people will have heard the, the classic Squarespace advert or MailChimp or a mattress advert. And even if you roll your eyes, the fact that the podcast host who you like and trust and listen to every week, they're the one telling you that this brand of mattress is better than any other that they've tried. That carries more weight with you than seeing some random celebrity you don't know on television saying it or whatever, or hearing Absolutely. a voiceover artist in a radio spot. So yeah, that I really, really liked that engagement and that sort of immediacy and that almost, it's not instant because you do have have to make something good that people want to be part of before they'll come and be part of but once you've done that the community around a podcast is incredibly strong and lasting one small example of this i used to host a podcast for the new statesman called seriously which, which I, I loved we started i want to say in 2015 and then it finished at the end of 2018 i think and it's now 2020 and like i did a podcast convention in beginning of February with my detective fiction podcast multiple people came up to the booth I was working at to say that they had initially found me by seriously and that's really why they were there today um you know I've had people say that they bought my book because they liked seriously someone turned up to an event I did on a boat in, at the Henley Literary Festival and said that they liked me on that podcast five years ago and that that's why they'd come to see me speak at this event you know that's so it really it's incredibly powerful and um very long lasting yeah and it's interesting what you say about about intimacy and that you're in people's ears and it almost creates that sense of a, a relationship because i know you've mentioned that when you i've had friends who've come up to you at, so I, i'm essentially thinking of my wedding when some of my <laughs> friends saw you were there found out who you were and made a beeline for you and they hadn't previously met you because they were like we know each other she's in my ears all the time i feel i know her and for you it was simultaneously lovely and also slightly surprising because you of course didn't know them and didn't i don't know them ears. yeah it's an interesting effect that it's the only time i've ever really experienced that but i'm sure people who you know are very popular writers or whatever probably have that same effect where it it feels like a two-way relationship but it's really a one-way relationship because <laughs> I don't know who's out there listening and it was just in it was always interesting with them um, so my co-host Anna and I for instance you know we'd hang out a lot outside of work and Anna's friends would sort of include me very much as if we'd known each other forever even though I was quite new to their group and vice versa because they heard me on her podcast all the time um, so it, it is it is lovely how it kind of smooths social transitions, but it can sometimes be a little bit jarring from the other side. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I suppose I was, I was thinking about Seriously and your current podcast, She Done It, and the distinctions between them, because I suppose the thing about Seriously is that 
there was an element of people phoning in or people writing in or sort of community building that was quite visible to the listener while she done it as more of a sort of I don't know I always feel like it's a storytelling podcast mm. even though I know you're in fact also doing literary criticism and history and all sorts because I get caught up in the stories that you're telling do you feel like there is you do have a glimpse of your sort of community behind that even if it's not as visible on the podcast yeah definitely but it is as you say it's it's on the periphery it's not actually in the show because yeah, yeah seriously we used to read listener emails often and play voicemails from them and that kind of thing and I think that's quite normal for that conversational style of podcast where it's not scripted and the listeners are part of that conversation as well um, with She Done It it's it's non-fiction and it is scripted and it's very much more read almost in the style of like a lecture or something like that rather than um, a conversation you know, it's just me as well so it's a conversation with myself um, mm. although I do sometimes have guests but I, on social media, you know, in comments on Instagram and on Twitter, listeners talk to me. And then I also have part of the way that I fund the ongoing existence of the podcast is I have a kind of, it's called the She Done It book club. It's a, like a sort of little membership group where people pay a monthly contribution and then they're part of this community. There's about 220 something people in it now and we have a, a forum and that only the people who are in the club can access so we're talking all the time in there about both stuff that's on the podcast but also related topics and that's really nice and it's actually been really really nice during lockdown that we've done stuff like um I managed to work out how to use uh, that simultaneous watching software and we've watched some detective fiction adaptations together and that kind of thing oh wow um, oh, yeah so that community definitely exists in, in that club. But yeah, I don't actually necessarily have listeners on the show. Although I did once, I did do one episode where it was recordings of listeners talking about their, mm. um, their book collections and stuff. But that was in 40 episodes. That's the one time I've done that. And I suppose one of the exciting things about the, the format of She Done It is it does allow you to take, uh, I'll say maybe relatively niche passion I mean personally I'm very interested in it but you know female detectives many of them I suppose writing sorry detective novelists many of them writing in between the wars it's I suppose it's something that I'm trying to think of another format where you could have that kind of interest and pursue it and allow people who are also very interested in that to pursue it with you because in a book it would be sort of end stopped you know it would be mm. closed off it would, and you couldn't really take your readers in, into it and along with you on the journey and be influenced by them so I suppose that particular kind of scripted podcast do you feel like it does allow you to just follow what what interests you and be kind of freer than you would be with other formats definitely i think it's one of the quirks of podcasting that almost the more niche your show is the better it's likely to do in terms of listener numbers because rather than trying to be all things to all people you're trying to be one thing to one defined group of people mm. and part of when i was thinking about the idea of doing a podcast about this i you know i sort of explored the idea of well, like is this too niche are there only about 15 other people who will want to listen to this and will care about it but then i thought you know agatha christie is is in contention for being one of the best-selling writers of any kind of all time you know her books sell hundreds of millions of copies still if it's a niche it's a pretty big one was what mm. i kind of came to but being very specific and detailed I think makes people like it more it makes them feel like you know they they identify with it as something that they enjoy and that there are other people listening who do as well so it does make you feel like you're part yeah. of something um, yeah I mean I personally really gravitate towards podcasts that are very specifically about something that I like I listen to a podcast called pen addict that is about pens um, you know and you know fountain pens, good ballpoint pens, etc, etc, reviewing them, discussing them, uh, you know, so I, I feel like that's the effect overall, but you're absolutely right, it's counter to perhaps the impulse in other kinds of media, you know, when you're pitching a book, for instance, especially a non-fiction book, you have to write a whole section in the proposal about why this will appeal to the whole market, why is this mm. potentially a bestseller? Why will people like it? What other books are there like it that demonstrate that there is appetite for this book whereas with a podcast i feel like almost you have to do the opposite you have to say like why there's no one doing this and why therefore this podcast is needed yeah that's so interesting and i suppose what's lovely about your book which 
I have here, and I am going to hold up the way to the sea. I believe I it's now in the hardback as well. I have the hardback, it's yes. Nice, yeah. <laughs> but I believe, yeah, now available in paperback, right? Came out in paperback at the beginning of March, like a week before the world went mad. <laughs> oh no, so you couldn't do all the things you might have planned to do. Yeah. Well, I was actually very lucky that I did most of my sort of out and about book publicity with the hardback I was very lucky to right. be invited to lots of literary festivals and so on which actually meant that I didn't really have much on for this year because no one was going to ask me again to talk about the same book you know um yeah so I did you know did interviews and stuff like this remotely and didn't I don't think I really missed out on anything um, oh that's good okay a I happy know, lockdown story it has been a problem obviously for the publishing industry more generally that bookshops are closed and you know, events are happening and all that kind of thing. Of course, yeah. And I suppose that the nice thing about some of the online literary festivals is maybe that they're giving people the opportunity to attend who wouldn't normally, like I've seen the Hay Literary Festival, mm. which, you know, it's very cheap to get to a ticket to one of the events and get to kind of access it. But that's a slight side note, because I was going to try and make a smooth segue that I failed in from the specificity of the podcast to the specificity of the book, because on the one hand, it is very specific. It's the forgotten histories of the Thames estuary. And in a way, it's about a single journey along the Thames estuary but then on the other hand it's sort of moving in it back and forth in, in space and in time and you go back to all these different periods of history I love the way it sort of jumped around in history depending on where spatially we were and then it's also a personal history of both your own experience of that journey your experience of other journeys and your parents experience which is kind of where it all begins of, of sailing would you say a bit about which of those many exciting kind of temporal strands was the first strand and what kind of led you into the book and then how did all those different elements sort of build up? So I think my parents' story was the the first strand because that was the part that I sort of felt most confident was interesting, if that makes sense. <laughs> because uh, just to summarise it briefly, my parents were born and brought up in South Africa. In their early 30s, they moved to Cape Town and they got interested in sailing. They'd had no previous experience. They're both from Johannesburg, which is many, many miles from the sea. And they got interested in sailing and they really enjoyed it. And they were also sort of at a point politically and personally where they didn't really want to be in South Africa anymore. And they initially planned on, I think it was meant to be a two year career break. So they worked really hard for three years. It took them evenings and weekends to build their own boat. And then their idea was that they were going to sail to Europe, maybe spend two years, almost the kind of classic gap year thing, although they were older, they were going to sail, work, maybe stop and get temporary jobs in places. And then eventually they would go back and sort of resume their careers. And that didn't really, it didn't really happen like that. They did sail to Britain but then once they got here they decided that they wanted to stay. So I grew up, I, my sister and I were then born once they'd settled in Kent and I sort of grew up with this story of well you're I mean and it's not as overt obviously as it would be for anyone who was not white or anything like that but my parents are demonstrably not British they don't sound British and I think in some of their sort of preferences and habits they are obviously not brought up in England and so people would ask like where are your parents from and why do they talk like that is your mum from New Zealand was a, a comment we used to get quite often so I was quite used to telling this story I was quite good at it I suppose because I'd done it a lot and I'd heard them talk about it. And so I knew that people found it interesting and even remarkable that they'd, you know, made this big emigration in a small boat and all that kind of thing. So that's I mean, kind it is of, remarkable. Yeah. So that's kind of where I started with that. That's that is an interesting thing that I think people would like to know more about. And then everything else sort of built on top of that, I suppose. Mm. And I have to credit my agent Sophie Lambert with a lot of the work on sort of keeping all of the threads distinct <coughs> um, yeah she was very very good at helping me with that because my first attempt at sort of writing the first chapter was incredibly muddled and I didn't really know how to how to keep them distinct so that the reader could tell what was happening mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's interesting I hadn't thought of that just the literal challenge of jumping about in time of having kind of narrative threads that the reader can follow while also because I suppose one of the almost the arguments of the book is that places and that the river on the one hand is 
always moving and always changing and on the other hand it holds on to things and things mm, can be kind yes. of uncovered or rediscovered and so I guess trying to keep the sort of almost the archaeology of the book at the same time as having that pro propelling forward narrative of your story rediscovering it now I can see how those are yeah lots of threads to untangle. Yeah I discovered in the writing of it something that I hadn't necessarily really noticed I'd enjoyed that in other books that I admired but I guess not having tried to do it myself yet I didn't quite understand the craft of it but you know you do have to be very organized about making sure that you are constantly keeping all of those different pots on a boil as it were and that you're not flipping between them too much but you're also uh what's the word you're also kind of giving people enough of each one all the time to feel like it's engaged without giving them kind of whiplash of being like okay now we're in the fifth century and now oh hang on now it's today and oh now it's 1985 again and, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing yeah absolutely and i guess another challenge must have been because obviously as a journalist you're very used to telling stories and telling other people's stories and telling stories from the past how hard was it to turn that lens sort of on yourself and your own family? Did it feel vulnerable or strange or did it, did it mm. seem like just an extension of your normal process? No, it definitely was very strange to me. And I thought that this book was way too much about me. Like I, that was my big fear about it, that it was, and I'm not, you know, famous or particularly remarkable and that therefore, what, you know, why would anybody want to read this book that was mostly just about me? Um, and then one of the the review of the book that I liked the, the most was the one that Aditya Chakraborty did in The Guardian. And in it, he made the point <laughs> that there is actually page by page almost nothing about me in this book. That he pointed out that I think he said that there's a set the section about the Magna Carta is longer than the section about me having cancer. And that he found <laughs> it, it wasn't and he wasn't saying it to be critical, but he was just saying it's kind of an unusual thing to find in a memoir that there's actually very little yeah. of the person directly in the book you know talking about themselves and that I found that so enlightening it made me really reconsider it in that light that although to me as someone who had spent you know 10 years and been trained to not write about herself it felt like I'd yes. done a lot of it actually objectively I hadn't so yeah that was yeah. a really interesting revelation yeah, and that is fascinating that you experienced the book like that, because reading the book, I felt very aware that, you know, there were some lovely tantalising glimpses of you and bits of your past history. But, you know, and there was a lot, you know, there was obviously the story of your parents. But I felt that, yeah, it was always like, oh, exciting when you popped up, because I similarly felt like, yeah, that, that definitely wasn't the focus. But it's interesting that he used the word memoir, because I think generically it's a really interesting book, because I feel like the in terms of new genres, you know, the podcasts that you've been drawn to are a very new genre. But then I also feel like this, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's sort of narrative nonfiction rather than memoir specifically, because mm. it's telling true stories as a narrative without, as you say, your narrative necessarily being the key strand. And were you, were you aware of that as a relatively new genre you were writing into when you were writing it? Was that the kind of genre you had as a, as a model? Or were you thinking about it in terms of a memoir where you were kept receding or a history book? Or no, I think else? you're right. That's, that is definitely how I would characterise it. And I think I first encountered that term narrative nonfiction in relation to a sort of American long form essay writing, actually, oh, um, in the work of people like um, Leslie Jameson and so on. Um, which does do a good job of sort of putting the writer in the piece but not being autobiographical completely if that makes sense and yeah so that's absolutely how how I thought of it and then it also felt important within that overall heading to have elements of different things like some memoir some history some kind of what you might loosely call sort of sociology, uh, mm -hmm. archaeology, all those different things that all made up. Because I feel like when you have a, a slightly broad umbrella title like that, you do have to get specific at some point. Um, and yeah, it just it felt important to nail that down. That's really interesting. And so to have, even while you were jumping between these different genres, to have that kind of specificity with each one that you're sort of mm. writing at any given moment which I guess is like what you were saying about the temporalities as well finding the the time that you're in at the point any sentence so 
the level of sentences and paragraphs and having that clarity. Um, yeah, it might not be the, the case for everybody, but for me, writing a book involves a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> like I, find it, I find it really useful to, uh, to really, to use that sort of grid structure to mark all these things out. That is fascinating. So are they colour coded or are they just, is it sort of oh. by chapter or how does the spreadsheet work? Well, so I, I ha I've definitely had a spreadsheet that I don't think I referred to that much once I was like really deep into writing the book, but it was very important at the beginning where I had, you know, chapters down the side and then across the top, the different strands that I was trying to keep running. And, you know, the cell that where the two met in each case was me saying, well, what is the element in that chapter that meets that, that case mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and then I also had <laughs> the what I in my head call the spreadsheet of accountability, which is the way I tricked myself into writing the book, <laughs> actually doing it, which was a just a very simple thing where it had the, each day I'd write the date down the side and then I had to write the number of words I'd written that day next to it. That's punishing. <laughs> and, and if I hadn't, I felt written enough words, instead I had to write what was my excuse. Because when you have to look back up your, and your excuses are things like overslept, didn't feel like it, <laughs> such, you just, it, it sort of mounts up in your mind, it's like you're just not trying. Um, you know, you might have good excuses like I wasn't well or my sister was visiting or whatever, but you probably also have some not adequate ones. And then at the bottom, I set it to uh, add up the total so far and then subtract from the word count I was aiming for for the whole book and then divide that what was left by the number of days left to write the book and that gives you your kind of necessary word rate as it were and if you have a few days where you don't do anything the word rate creeps up and suddenly you have to write 1500 words a day if you're going to make the deadline and then when you are good about it it drops down and you're like hey i can totally do 500 words a day this is great um yeah so that that really kept me accountable for what i was doing i love i love the maths of this i don't think i'd ever imagined a process that's i'm so not a very mathematical person either i don't know why i was felt drawn to this system but it worked Amazing. Well, I know that you're not yet at the stage where you've got a spreadsheet for another book or anything like that, but are there other general things either in book form or in article form that you're writing about in the moment or that you're looking forward to writing about in the near future? Uh, are there kind of ideas or themes? I'm definitely, I'm definitely interested in writing more about the relationship between, it sounds so vague, but kind of the self and the world if that makes sense. Mm. Um, I've sort of become so aware recently that the way I think of myself is not necessarily how I always present, I think. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, and so that's a kind of difference that, that I, want, I want to explore. Yeah, that sounds vague, but I, I'm not very far on in my thinking with it yet. I love it. That sounds really interesting. All right. Well, I will, I will look out for that in the coming years once the spreadsheet has, has been yes. completed. Um, and sadly, I mean, I could keep asking you about your spreadsheets and your processes <laughs> all day, but it's probably the time to draw, draw to a close. So we always end these videos by asking, what is literature? And the answers can be really personal or odd or metaphorical or just whatever comes into your head. So Caroline, what is literature to you? So I think I have quite a broad Sorry. <coughs> so I think I have quite a broad definition of literature, having been sort of trained in an educational system in a university that had quite a narrow understanding of what literature was, and perhaps I sort of reacted against it. But I think I've always thought of it as work that makes you feel something, oh. work that works that make you want to respond to them. Um, that have enough ideas and so on in them that you think about them for days and weeks and years, um, which is not, and I also don't think that it's necessarily a value judgment so much, because I think there are certain, definitely categories of books and art and so on where you absolutely enjoy them and you get a lot out of them in the moment, but they don't linger. Like as soon as you close the book, it's gone. And I know for a lot of people that that's crime fiction, for instance. Obviously, I spend a lot of time thinking about it and I, it has that for me. But I know for a lot, a lot of people, they really enjoy reading it, 
and they enjoy the experience of reading it, but then it doesn't really linger with them, it doesn't carry on. So I think for me, that's, that's the definition, yeah. That's lovely. And I like that because it, it sort of implies that it's act, the kind of literature is acting upon you, whether it's mm. on your kind of almost your bodily feelings or upon your mind and then something that, yeah, lingers. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Caroline, for joining me today. Mm, thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye bye.